Hello again, everybody. This is our video solution to problem five from quiz four, spring 2023, math 302 at Cal State Fullerton. And we move on to one of our legacy standards. This is equivalence relations. So uh, let's see, in this problem, we are told that D is going to denote the set of all functions from the reals to the reals that are everywhere differentiable. Okay, so functions like sine of x, right? It's uh, a function on the reals, to the reals and you can differentiate sine for all x so there's a good example all right maybe e to the x another good example uh, any polynomial right so you have lots of functions that are everywhere differentiable all right if you have two functions that are differentiable everywhere we're going to say they're related right or right f comma g right is in r if they have the same derivative okay so if f prime equals g prime and in the first part of this problem we want to show that this actually gives us an equivalence relation. And this should be very straightforward. It really essentially comes down to the fact that equality is an equivalence relation. So uh, let's do here 5a first. And to show we have an equivalence relation, we have three conditions. We have to check reflexivity. We have to check symmetry. And we have to check transitivity. Okay, now, reflexivity is always the odd duck. It's the only one where you don't make an assumption about something actually being in the relation already. All right, this is the one where we have to prove a pair is in the relation, namely the reflexive pair. Okay, so I'm going to let F be in D. I just take some element in the set, and now I need to show that the reflexive pair for that element is in the relation. Okay. Well, what would it mean for f comma f to be an r? It would mean that f prime is equal to f prime. That's what we need to show. Well, of course that's true. <laughs> the derivative of a function is equal to its derivative. So since f prime is equal to f prime, we have f prime comma, I'm sorry, not f prime, but f comma f is in the relation. Now note, I am not saying if f comma f is in the relation, then f prime equals f prime. Why? Well, because that's not what we have to prove. We have to prove that f f is in R. We cannot assume it. All right, let's move on to symmetry. Now, when we go to symmetry, we're going to assume we have a pair of functions whose uh, ordered pair really is in R. Now I already have an f, so let me take a g. So let's let g be in D, such that the pair f comma g is in R. Well, what does this mean? All right. Well, the definition right is that f prime equals g prime. So this implies f prime equals g prime. But of course, by the symmetry of equality, this implies g prime equals f prime. And this implies that g comma f is in R. Okay, so we get symmetry, no worries. All right, finally, I wanna do transitivity. So I'm gonna need a third function. So let's let H be in D, such that, well, I've already assumed FG is in R, so now I'm just gonna assume G comma H is in R. So this implies that G prime is equal to H prime. But now we have F prime equals G prime, and we have G prime equals H prime put those together by the transitivity of equality, f prime equals h prime. And that implies that f comma h is in the relation. All right, so right here, we, we finish showing that r is an equivalence relation. Okay, so what does 5b tell us or ask us? Ah, it says describe all of the functions in the equivalence class of the function e to the x squared. Describe all of the functions in the equivalence class of the function e to the x squared. Okay, what is the equivalence class of e to the x squared? Let's, let's write that down. So I'll use the square brackets to denote the equivalence class. All right, so the equivalence class of e to the x squared is going to be the set of all functions in D such that e to the x squared comma f is in the relation. Okay, well, what does it mean 
that e to the x squared comma f is in the relation. It means they have the same derivative. Okay, so this is equal to all functions f and d such that the derivative of e to the x squared is equal to the derivative of f. Ah, but there is a nice theorem in calculus that tells you when two functions have the same derivative, right? In fact, you maybe think about it the other way. If I have a function and I try to find an antiderivative, I know that, well, there's lots of options, but they all look almost the same, right? In fact, they are the same up to a constant. Okay, so you probably remember something like this, right? Let's say you were taking an antiderivative of x squared, and you said, ah, oh, that's one-third x cubed, and then your teacher told you, oh, but you got to write plus c. Okay, well, that would be giving you all of them as long as you write down something like for some c in the real numbers. Okay, so all of the antiderivatives of a function, right, differ by a constant. So what are all of the functions that will end up having the same derivative as e to the x squared, it's simply all of the functions that are e to the x squared plus a constant. So this is equal to all things of the form e to the x squared plus a constant, where c is a real number. That then is the equivalence class, okay, for e to the x squared. Okay, what about 5C? 5C asks you, show that the quotient set is infinite. All right, so the quotient set, D modulo R, right, this is equal to the set of all equivalence classes, right? So these are the R equivalence classes. Of D. All right, so we, in 5b, wrote down a single equivalence class. This is a single element of the quotient set. So what we would like to do is show that there's actually an infinite number of these equivalence classes. And so one way we could do that is by showing that there is an infinite number of functions that are not equivalent to each other. All right? And based on what we were doing before, right? remember, two functions are only going to be equivalent if they differ by a constant. So consider the following set. Take the, uh, the polynomial 1. Take the polynomial x. Take the polynomial x squared. Take the polynomial x cubed. And just keep going. Okay. So we, we look at all of these. So, so if you like, this is equal to the set of all polynomials of the form, whoops, x to the n, we take their equivalence class and we let n be a non-negative integer. Okay. This does not give us all of the equivalence classes in D, not by a long shot. We don't, for example, get e to the x squared's equivalence class. However, this is a subset of the quotient set. And it is certainly an infinite subset. So this is an infinite subset since none of these elements are equal. Right? These are pairwise distinct. OK, so what am I saying here? If I take x to the n, and x to the m, these will not be equal if n is not equal to m. Since x to the m plus a constant is never equal to x to the n, right? right? And this is true for all real numbers c, right? If you have different powers on your x, then the functions are just going to be different, right? Even when you add a constant. Right? That, that, that can't change that. Okay. Now, this is not the only way of showing that there's an infinite number all right, of, um, uh, of equivalence classes. Okay? But this is kind of a, a very straightforward one. Right? You might come up with your, your own version. Okay. 
All right, this is probably, you know, the hardest one for students to grok, right? So you got to think about this, you know, very carefully what this is meaning. If I ask you to show that a quotient set has an infinite cardinality, you don't need to necessarily find all the elements in the quotient set. What you do need to do is demonstrate an infinite collection of pairwise distinct equivalence classes. And that's what we can do. All right, everybody, that's the end of quiz four. We'll see you all next time.